Hello, and welcome to uh, Senator Spilka's annual seniors event. Uh, if you folks who don't know me, my name is Arthur Bergeron. I've actually spoken here quite a few times in the past regarding specific legal issues um, because that's all kind of I do is deal with elders. I work at a firm called Mark O'Connell. There are 68 of us, um, about 40 in Worcester, 20 in Westboro, and 10 in Boston. And because there are so many of us, everybody gets to kind of pick what they do, and so I do elder law. Um, but the reason why I got into elder law was my mother died in a nursing home in 1991. I remember seeing this play out with my dad, and all, it was all bad. And I remember back then when it wasn't even Alzheimer's, it was like hardering of the arteries or something. And so over the last several years, we've been working on an initiative um, that, we, that we found was already being developed in Minnesota on trying to help communities become dementia friendly. What is a dementia friendly community? I broadly will define that as a community in which I can continue to live uh, no matter how confused I get. I can continue to live in my own town and be safe and be happy and not be embarrassed all the time by the fact that I can't remember stuff. That's broadly a dementia friendly community. So before I start, I just want to ask, where are you folks from? Where you, what town? Ashland. Oh, you're Ashland. Holliston. Holliston. Ashland. Ashland. Is, that looks like Ashland. Ashland. Framingham. Framingham. Ashland. And Ashland. Ashland. So I know some of the Ashland folks and some of the um, uh, Holliston folks. So this initiative, um, we've gone through quite a few of the steps of it in Marlboro, Hudson, uh, and Northboro, um, where, where I'm from. I'm going to talk about that a little bit. I know it's just starting now in Ashland. And um, your selectman, is it Jim? Jim? Yeah. Steve? Yeah. Steve. Mitchell. Steve Mitchell. Steve, I keep doing this. See, you know, you know I'm slipping myself. Steve Mitchell is leading it. And I know that Sam Wong, who is the health director in, um, in Framingham, is really interested in doing this in Framingham. Uh, and I talked to recently to your, the, the, you know, the head of your senior center. Um, and, and I think there's, just gonna, there's a lot of interest in this already. So the goal of this really is to kind of talk to you about um, how this all works and how you could think about your community being a dementia-friendly community. Now, I invited one guest, Tammy Pozzaricki. She's right here. If you don't know her, you should. She's going to talk about three different things that I think are really key elements of a dementia-friendly community. And what makes her unique is that she does them all. So I just want to kind of give you a, a sense, though, of what these possibilities are. So the goal of this, for those of you who've seen my presentations, this is my friends Frank and Mary. I always talk about Frank and Mary and their kids, Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr. I always tell my, I always tell my presentations, if you're old enough to get that joke, you're old enough to be my client. <laughs> But I, and, I, and I tell them, I said, you know, their goal is very simple. They want to, and they're their kids, Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr., and, and they want to live in their house until they die. They want to be buried in the backyard. It's very simple, right? So the question is, if Mary starts having some memory problems, um, so what do they do? What do they do? Of course, they're going to be able probably to continue in their house, and there are a lot of things they can do in their house. They can make adaptations to their house to make it safe. You know, they can bring people to come into the house. But the question, and, and people do that, right? But the question is, how do they not just become trapped in their house all the time? Because they're afraid to go out. They don't want to go out because you don't want to walk around the neighborhood. Well, first of all, Mary might get lost. But even be really beyond that, it's that day to day, you don't want to be embarrassed. Mary doesn't want to be bumping into somebody who says hello, oh, you, and inevitably they'll say, you remember me, don't you? You know, because they know they have dementia. Well, no, you know. So, so it's it just hard, that whole world is just really hard to do. So the question is kind of like how to figure this out, how to cause this to be a dementia-friendly community. So what, the way that we started figuring this out is I work with Christine Alessandro. Christine is the head of, of Bay Path Elder Services, which covers all of, the, all of your towns. Bay Path is the, is the regional entity that is basically the funnel through which federal and state dollars come for the benefit of seniors. The state's divided into 27 regions. Your region is, is done by Bay Path Elder Service. And she's terrific. I, I've met a lot of the directors of ASAPs around the state. She's one of the most innovative people I've met in terms of really trying to develop programs. And, and so she very well may be helping you. In, as a matter of fact, I think that Bay Path is actually paying the staff person that's helping you in Ashland right now. And that helped, and, and a staff person actually, this Cindy here, Cindy Cormier, who's working my table outside, was actually the staff person in the communities where we work. So she's really terrific. So 
what we did, what we found was that there was a program in Minnesota that had these features to it and it was called Act on Alzheimer's where they had, where they had over the previous several years um, done grants to individual communities to try to develop uh, or, or, or to, to try to develop plans for how they could become dementia friendly. And so what we did was we went to Minnesota, um, my, my law firm and some, there was some grant money and we paid to bring everybody out and that's, so there's Christine there and Trish Pope who is the uh, head of the senior, the senior center in Marlboro and Janice Long from Hudson and, uh, and um, Kelly Burke from Northboro. And we spent two days uh, in a hotel out next, across the street from Mall of America. So they all shopped, I didn't shop, um, doing training. And they had pe folks from uh, Act on Alzheimer's who had been doing this, talking to us about how to do this. And then we came back and we, and we talked about the things we liked and didn't like about Minnesota. One of the things that we really liked was the, or, or that we really, was this real focus on individual communities. This isn't a regional effort, this isn't a top-down effort. It's about making Ashland a uniquely dementia-friendly community. It's about, because Ashland's different from Framingham, right? Oh God, you know, like really different. And Holliston, oh, another universe, right? So, the, you know, the, the question is, how do, you, how, how do you make these places unique? But the system, in the system that we, that we saw them use, we really liked, which was to get folks together, develop your local group of people, who, typically people who are either um, interested because they're service providers, people from the police department, the fire department, several of the police chiefs were directly involved in this, for example, because they deal with it all the time, as well as folks who are in the community who have maybe have, have dealt with this, that because they're caregivers dealing with folks with dementia. So you start off with local volunteers, you get them together, you, start, you do a public meeting, to tell people in the community what you're doing, um, then you look at your community and you divide it up by sectors. Sectors meaning sectors of folks that a person who is an older person in general, but specifically a person who has dementia might need to be dealing with. Police, fire, town hall, the parks department, the restaurants, the banks. The, I mean, there are a set of places where the supermarket, so where do you go when you're older where you still want to go but you're trapped in your house because you're afraid to go because you know people are going to make fun of you because you have dementia. So we did though and then you try to develop a plan and so that's what we did and so all three communities we developed the we developed these teams of volunteers that's me right? that's our Marlboro team uh, in each of the towns folks you know and we basically used the Minnesota um, materials which are all there and by the way you have the handouts which give you the, the, the website for Act on Alzheimer's, for the Minnesota model, if you want to kind of see the stuff that they have there. And then we all went, went out and we did the surveys. We did about 100 surveys per community, actually. The groups did a lot of work over about a four-month or five-month period and came back and got together and started developing plans. Now, each one of these plans is unique to that community but, you know, actually kind of to the surprise of some of these folks, they shared a lot in common because we found that across communities, the issues that came up were, were, were often similar. So what I want to do now is I want to, I'm going to talk about from all of that what, what you might be, want to think about if you're thinking about in totality what your community would look like if it were a dementia-friendly community. There are really four pieces to this that I came to appreciate. There's awareness in the community, there's sector training, there's the institutions that you need, and then there's caregiver support. So we're gonna talk about each one of those. Okay, first of all, there's awareness. And, and this, of course, came up over and over again, that the issue, if Mary is walking in her neighborhood and is really nervous about being in the neighborhood, is that her neighbors kind of don't know what um, dementia is. And, and, and by the way, I should step back and say, so what is dementia? Uh, many people confuse de dementia and Alzheimer's. Alzheimer's is a disease. Dementia is a set of symptoms, right? The typically biggest symptom is you don't remember things. There are clusters of things around that. As life goes on, you don't remember things to a greater and greater extent, and eventually you kind of don't remember how to brush your teeth or how to do the very basic things. But that's kind of the, the concept. So the question is, if Mary's walking in the neighborhood, how, how, does she, how can she really be comfortable? Um, and the way is that her neighbors get what she's got. 
and realize that they don't have to walk on the other side of the street when she's walking down the street, right? Um, and that it doesn't help them to talk louder if they're talking to her. It doesn't help them to say, oh, you remember me. Well, yeah. no, maybe not. Maybe I don't remember you. Um, but it, it's, uh, it's developing an awareness of what the, what the disease is and how you interact with folks. So just one of the things, in, so in, in, uh, in Northbro, um, one of the awareness tools that they've done is they did a set of palm cards with, which they're distributing to all the businesses. Uh, in Marlboro, we have a website that people can go to, and to, it, it, both if they want to learn about Alzheimer's and if they also want to learn about the programs that we're now doing in Marlboro. But each community is going to develop its own kind of unique set of awareness tools to deal with the broader community, because there's some level of knowledge that everybody in the community has to have. Um, beyond that, though, there is some knowledge that particular sectors really, really have to have, because these are the people that, who, are, who are really dealing with seniors kind of day to day and might be really, and, and their interactions with seniors with dementia could be really bad, right? Or really good. First, there's the police department. The police department are bumping into these issues all the time. If somebody wanders, you call the police. How are the police going to exactly find these people, you know? And, and, and more importantly, what are they going to say when they see them? Um, if there's a traffic stop, one of the police in, uh, in Marlboro was talking about the fact that if you've got somebody who is trained to deal with folks with dementia, it changes that traffic stop completely. If you stop somebody and they are extremely agitated and aggressive in dealing with you as a police officer, your immediate reaction is that person's drunk or they got a drug problem. And so the way you're dealing with this really is that enforcement question, get out of the car, you know, you know, start doing the alphabet backwards, do all that stuff, you know. Whereas if you know that the person has dementia, either because you've been kind of trained to see the signs, right, uh, or because that person is on the dementia registry in your community, and we're going to talk about that in a second, it changes the whole stop. So, oh, Mr. Bergeron, you know, you get, Mr. Bergeron, you know, I see, you know, you may be having some problem. Is there anything I can help you with? You know, I see that, I see from, uh, you're on the registry, you know, you're, you're, you know, you're, you, can I help you home? You know, I know where you live. It changes the whole stop, right? Home visits, regularly the police are called for, to deal with domestic, well, domestic disputes. Not, uh, not, un, not unusually, one of the folks in that domestic dispute has got dementia, right? So how do you deal with it? This is, is this an abuse case, right? Or, and maybe it is, you know, but is, is, it, is it also really kind of a dementia, is that really what it's about? So those folks really need to be trained. So all three of the police chiefs uh, in the three communities were very involved in this. Each one of them developed their own version of a, a, uh, a registry, which each one of them is now doing, each one of the three communities, where if you, your loved one has dementia, or if you do, but typically it's your loved one who's kind of taking care of this, um, you can, the, 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 the local, the, the outreach police officer will come to your home and actually interview you and talk to you and just get, you know, get a sense of what's going on. And if the person with dementia is comfortable with that, take their picture, right? Get some basic information about them, get the contact information, who do I call, you know, so that if, you know, if Mary is in the parking lot at the Walmart, kind of looking around and can't find her car and, and, and either the Walmart folks come up and now they call the police and the police show up. Now all of a sudden, not only do the police know what to do, but they also know who Mary is because they've got her picture on their phone because she's part of the dementia registry, right? So now at this point, um, it was, you know, the results vary. In Marlboro there are 24 people who are on the registry, in Northboro only two, in Hudson 32. Hudson has probably been Oh, they, all three communities have been very, very active. The, but the, the, the senior center director in Hudson, Janice Long, unbelievable, just unbelievable in terms of doing this kind of outreach. And I'm going to refer to her a couple times a little bit, a little bit later on. So this, this is really kind of taken off there. What about the fire department? These folks, when they show up at the house, when the first responder, right, shows up at the house, you can't be saying what happened. You know, the woman's on the floor. She's got a, you know, a head injury. She doesn't know what happened. She's got dementia, you know? And what do they deal with? There, there was a kind of a standing joke in the fire departments. Oh, that's one of the frequent flyers. We're going back to that house again, it's, you know? But beyond that, what do they do? What is, what is the connection of the fire department with 
the public health department and with the police department? How can we be helping folks who are there as opposed to waiting for them to get hurt, right? So um, in both of these areas, the key to this has been training. So in both, in, 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 in Hudson, they started in Hudson, and now in Northboro and in Marlboro, they hired her, they hired Tammy Pazaricki to do that training. So I want her to talk to you a little bit about the nature of that training and the, and the interactions with the police department and the fire department. Tammy. Good morning. So I am, um, I've been in healthcare for about 22 years as a social worker and, and now, you know, after going through the journey with Alzheimer's with my grandmother, it really drove my passion to work with folks and caregivers with dementia. Um, and as part of what Arthur said, my efforts have just um, been solely focused on improving the lives of folks dealing with this disease because it's a very long journey. Um, so I am a certified first responder dementia trainer and also trained staff at healthcare facilities and communities. And we started in Hudson and we've got all the Hudson police, fire and EMTs trained. We're working on Marlboro and Northboro. And by the way, that and happened over what period of time that you um, did all the training of, the, of all the first responders? Of, of Hudson, it happened within one month. We right. did it within one month. We got them because, all, and because it was the, over five the chiefs trainings. were really involved, so they really wanted to get their people trained. Yeah. So the, the the essence of the training is to teach them communication strategies and inter interventions. Um, you know, they're taught through their profession to be demanding, commanding, and challenging. Okay, and with someone with dementia. That's the absolute thing you don't want to do. So it's teaching them a different perspective of how to handle someone with dementia. And we're not just looking for the older adult in the community. This disease is affecting people in their 40s, 50s, 60s. So how does a police officer go to a home where an individual with dementia is hallucinating? or having uh, delusions. How do they handle that differently? Well, they're taught originally in their officer training to talk that person out of it, okay? And to handle it if they need to by force. So teaching them a way in which to join that person in their reality and go with it, enter that delusion or that hallucination and how to become their trusted ally. And one of the things that um, we'll talk about later, what I do, what I've created as a, an adult day program, when I've needed to call 911 and get a response for someone having a medical event, the history was horrifying of the response because you call 911, you get police, fire, EMT, all in the house, lights flashing outside, lights, sirens, yeah. and six people going towards that person who's having the medical event. Completely awful for the person with dementia. If one person knows how to communicate with that individual and address the individual, you prevent that person from increasing in all the symptoms that we see from dementia. So, and it's changing, I see it. I see the police, fire, and EMT, they're completely changing the way they approach folks with dementia, so it's super exciting. And you mentioned that several of those folks, of course, had relatives with dementia. Oh, that's the other thing, right. is during these classes, um, and I'm gonna ask you folks the same question I asked them. How many of you have been personally affected by a dementia disease? You know someone, you love someone with a disease. Anyone here? Right? Inevitably, whatever audience I am training, at least half or more have been touched by this. So it is an epidemic, and what our efforts are is to address this epidemic so that we can create folks to want to come out of their home. Thank you very much, Tammy. You're now, welcome. Tammy, is, is they're going, in, in Hudson, they're going beyond just the first responders, and now they're going to be doing, they're going to be doing or are doing training with folks from the restaurants, for example, um, folks from supermarkets, folks from banks. Um, 
And in, and, and in addition to that, um, Tammy is now going to be training the folks in Hudson and Marlboro, or is doing that now, right? Yeah, right now in, in Marlboro and in Northboro. In North, in Marlboro. But, the, the, but so I make a couple of observations. So, so Tammy started doing this because of her grandmother. Everybody starts doing this because they know somebody and they get it. Suddenly they get it. Um, her, her, so I'm going to talk about kind of other background stuff, but the, the point is there are trainers. The reason why she is competent to do this training, she's gotten some you know, specialized training, but more importantly, this is what she does every day because she, she, she runs a business in which there are folks that are there who have dementia every day. Similarly, in Framingham, you know, you've got a couple of assisted living communities that have dementia communities within them. So there are already the players in the local community that can do this kind of training. The only question is how do you, how do you institutionalize that? How do you cause that knowledge that is there to be used in your own community? Uh, to deal with places like restaurants. You know, you go into a restaurant, the last thing I need if I've got dementia is somebody hands me the, re the menu with the 40 items. And I'm looking going, what? I mean, I can't do that now. I can't deal with that, you know? But so in, a, so in a dementia friendly community, the restaurant, it's like, oh, Mr. Bergeron, so would you like the chicken today or the fish? Or even better, Mr. Bergeron, you know, the chicken's really good today. I know you usually like the chicken, right? So the question is, how, how, do, you, how do you have the menu that these folks deal with? How do you also develop the training of the staff? And that's crucial, especially in an industry where there's such turnover. Because you can train them today, but they're, but they're gone. Although, one of the interesting things in that business is you're, they're gone tomorrow because they're gone to another restaurant, right? So, if, once folks get this, it's a lot easier for them to kind of get it every place. Um, th there is that, I'm just going to mention the, the, uh, the Red Raven, because the Red Raven, the woman who, who runs the Red Raven, once again, her mother had early stage Alzheimer's, who died fairly recently. So, she's really taken this issue on. And what is her name? Jennifer Apazitis. Jennifer Apazitis. And one of the things that she has done is really kind of gone beyond just training the staff to actually having a device through which if you want to go to that restaurant and if you want to go to some others on this, that website, the Purple Tables website, you can get a Purple Table reservation. I want to come to your restaurant. You know, my wife has dementia. Oh, great. So what we're going to do is, you know, I, first we're going to not recommend that you come at the most busy time because the last thing that your wife with dementia needs is a lot of noise, right? Second, we're going to make sure that your table isn't like in the middle of the restaurant, but is a little more out of the way so that you're just, so that you're not feeling intimidated by all this stuff and so distracted, right? Third, your wait staff is going to be specifically trained. Right? Now, interestingly, one of the things that she has found, I think, Tammy, that you, you, you told me, is that, is that they're also attracting folks with kids who have got aut autism, people who have other issues, so that you've got to, because it's just, oh, they're the same issues. They're the same issues that you want people to be able to be secure, to be able to kind of be knowledgeable. So Purple Table, by the way, th this is not only a good idea, it's a, it's a real good it gives you a notion of where this could go. And I'm going to talk, and I think Tammy's going to talk a little bit more about that when we get to memory cafes. That if individual, beyond having individual communities do it, if you've got a chain of purple table restaurants who have signed on to that website, now all of a sudden you've got a bunch of options. You know, it isn't just the one, but, but, but once people in the individual communities appreciate hey, guess what, you know, you're having those problems in the neighboring community. There gets to be a lot more of this kind of inter-community cooperation. Um, finally, there are memory cafes. What is a memory cafe? Well, Tammy's going to explain that because one of the interesting things about memory cafes, when well, Tammy actually created the first one in Massachusetts, there are now almost 70, almost 70, 70 of them. Um, but to be described, so see, and, uh, so, and this isn't like an entire, oh, I'm just introducing Tammy again, but she's like, the, she really does stuff. I just kind of advertise. So T Tammy, sure. ex explain what that, what, what that is. So the Memory Cafe was actually started in Europe because what, what Dr. Meissen found was that people were isolating with this disease. So a Memory Cafe came to uh, United States in 2008, and I created the first one in Massachusetts in 2011. First one what here was a, in, New in New Mexico. In right? New Mexico, in, in United States. But a Memory Cafe is simply an accepting and supportive environment for the caregiver and their loved one with dementia to attend. 
It's free. They're, they have them at senior centers, libraries, restaurants like the Red Raven. I hold mine at Pleasant Trees, um, various locations. And it's just a, a, a place where folks can go to get out get out and engage with other people. So we have refreshments and we have entertainment and there's alternative therapies like music and pets. And the idea is that we've actually got a big network of folks who are running cafes now so that they're on different days and times in different locations throughout the state. And people, I have a whole group of folks, we call them the cafe hoppers because they go, that's their outlet when they don't wanna to go to the restaurant, when they don't wanna get out with their loved one for fear of embarrassment. So the memory cafes have taken off and they've gotten people to come out and enjoy their quality of life. So once again, there are already a whole bunch of them. I know on Tammy's website, she actually posts all of the ones that are in, in our immediate area around kind of what I'll, what I'll call the boroughs plus, the four boroughs, Hudson, Hopkinton, that, that area. But there's also, is there's, does the state website have all of them? The there Jewish was, Family and Children's Services has a directory that has all the whole, all of Massachusetts. But they don't, they don't get to do the dates and stuff, so you can't, do they have They the just say second Monday of this month, right, right. and you just have to confirm it. But once again, kind of like with the Purple Table restaurants, you can see how this evolves, you know? Because you, once you have enough, then you start having these websites where, so that you can literally say to Mary, Frank is say, so where do you want to go today? You know, you want to go to Northborough? You want to go to Ashland? You want to go to all, you know, there are a number of these places. Um, there's a brand new one that, is just, that just started in Northborough. Uh, we're having our first um, uh, memory cafe at a restaurant in Marlboro called Wellies. Once again, family had, had you know, experience with people with dementia. Another well-known Marlboro restaurant called Kennedy's, same thing. Families with dementia, very, they're very, very interested in this. So increasingly, there should be options for folks. And when you're thinking about you know, how your community ends up looking dementia friendly, I remember this great place downtown in Holliston. It's like a diner where I, where I had, what was it? In the center of town. Right in the center, because I, I, I remember I had sandwiches there with Mary Greendale one, one day, who's you know, kind of one of your many local activists, right? But every place has one of these, has kind of a natural place for one of these places. The bank. These folks really need to be trained, right? In a couple of different ways. First of all, if I'm at the bank, banking's confusing, you know, fill out the slip, do the thing, get your check, you know. So I really need somebody that can kind of help me out with that. Or if I'm one of those folks, a frequent flyer. I've had clients that have literally gone to the bank every day, every day, to take out $20, take out $10, check on their account, they get early, they get early stage problems. So to have staff, who are okay with that and comfortable with that, but at least as important, staff who, somebody shows up with you know, the, 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 this kid you've never seen before, and all of a sudden, they're going, that kid's going on all of the accounts, as like the joint owner. Now that may be just great. This may be you know, the trusted son. It could also be the very untrusted, scamming nephew or neighbor or somebody. So there needs to be, I think once, one of the things that we found from talking to banks is that banks start talking to each other about what are the protocols that should happen in that situation? Is there somebody that you need to call to just have somebody check up on that? Because once the money is gone, it's gone. You're never getting it back. I had a, I had a person actually in, in a, a client in Northbrook. Ended up being terrible because the, 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 the mother, um, no, the aunt, uh, he'd been living in the house with the aunt, and the aunt needed to qualify for Mass Health. She was in the nursing home, but couldn't because she had this joint account with the nephew, and eighty thousand dollars disappeared. And Mass Health's position was, oh, they presumed that was a gift, right? Oh, you have to give them; they have to give the money back, otherwise you can't qualify for Mass Health. Well, he stole the money. You know, he's gone. You know, so. It, it, at the bank is where you can kind of try to deal with some of those issues, you know, be kind of preemptively. The grocery store. Every senior, everybody, no, not everybody, I don't go, fortunately, my wife does, but every senior pretty much, that's one of the things you do. You go to the grocery store. And to not be able to do that, to be trapped in your house because you can't go to the grocery store, how bad is that, right? But that means that you need a grocery store where the staff, where first of all, 
They, they are going to help you out if you can't find your car in the parking lot. That's one of the most confusing parts. I never can find my car in that parking lot. I shouldn't say that, right? So, so it, but then in, in the, in the, when you're in the store, you know, I, I, there are some, some stores now that actually will, you know, that they'll actually have a symbol, like a dementia-friendly symbol, that there'll be one line that, so if, you th if you're having problems, right, you use that, you can use that line. But beyond that, you need the store, the players there to not be saying, oh, that's in aisle 14, right? They need to get you to aisle 14. They need to help you out. So, so and, and if that's what the store is, you know, suddenly you feel more kind of comfortable about that. Obviously, it, you know, there are other, some other options, like home delivery, right? For folks who are really, really upset about going to the store, each community, each set of stores in each community is going to respond to these issues kind of differently. Um, we've already talked about the kind of training that, that, uh, that Tammy has done. I'm just going to mention to you one of the things that came out of the initiative, though, in our three communities, and it might be great if it happens in this building, is at ASABET, ASABET which is our regional technical school, um, they decided that they were, this was so important to them that they were going to become a dementia-friendly technical school. And so over the last spring, they actually did trainings of every teacher in every one of the shops who are now training their carpenters, their hairdressers, restaurant employees, their, their restaurant is thinking, they have a restaurant there, their restaurant is thinking of, be, of having a, 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 a purple table reservation, all their kids are going to be trained. Imagine how good this is. Imagine how many kids coming out of Keith Tech, you know, they're not coming, you know, they're, they're going to be staying. A lot of those people are going to be staying, right? They're going to be your plumbers and your carpenters and you working at those restaurants to have a whole community of young people coming up, many of whom have seen these issues in their house. You know, grandma's got problems, you know. Um, to, it, it is going to fundamentally change the place. And similarly, Keith Tech plays that same role in this whole area, right? So it could really change things. Um, by the way, they also have a certified nurse assistant program there. Uh, as well as an LPN program, you know, for, for people who are already out. And, 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 and so they're, 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 in, they're adding uh, a dementia training component to all of those programs there. Once again, think about that as it affects the communities that are like immediately in this area. Also, when you think about, so how do people who aren't being specifically trained, because, you know, you've got Tammy or somebody else that's going into a sector, What's the ongoing training mechanism? Once again, it's probably in this building. Just like Acibet After Dark, you have the parallel program here at Keefe Tech. That will happen as soon as there are enough people from Ashland or from Framingham or from Holliston who are saying, this is really important. These are the kinds of programs that we really need to be having here. A couple of other things. Institutions. So, in every dementia-friendly community, or very close by, there need to be a certain set of institutions that are, that are being helpful. One of those is day programs, um, so that a caregiver can come to a day program with a person who has dementia and drop them off. And the person who has dementia is going to be having an enjoyable time being wherever they are, and the person who's just dropped them off is going to have a break and be able to go to the hairdresser, go to the store, pay the bills, do all of this stuff. Every community has to have this. Now, um, Hudson has already started, right? Hudson now has a program called Daybreak, which they've been work doing for three years now? Almost five years, wow. Tammy's, one of the Tammy's staff is involved in, in, in that program. So they, have, they run the program in the mornings. It's 11. Tell, tell, them, tell them a little bit about the Daybreak program. Sure. So the Daybreak program is a grant-funded program, and the grant actually came out of Bay Path Elder Services. And it's a, a drop-off respite program, and it's um, 11.30 to 2.30 every Thursday. Um, and it's phenomenal. They ask for a suggested donation of $15, and they get lunch. And it's just enough time for the person, the caregiver, to run errands or just go have a cup of coffee and take a deep breath. Um, so it's really nice, but it's based on a social model. So there's no medical care here. And I don't know if you want me to and, get and, into the different... And, 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 just, and just, no, but, no, but talk about, so, and this is, they're trying to do this in... in They've applied for a grant that's actually going to extend Daybreak into the Marlboro Senior Center and into the Northboro Senior Center. There are other communities that are already have a social model respite program. Uh, Littleton has one. 
Franklin has one. And I think this concept, in fact, I'm speaking at the Council on Aging about this type of thing to have in all the councils on aging, because they're seeing it every day. Right. And by the way, and so she said this is going to be funded by a grant. In the longer run, if you, if Ashland succeeds, right, if you end up with a group of people who are committed to doing this, right, then it needs to show up at the senior center. And ultimately, grants are great to get things started, but it needs to be there all the time, which means it probably needs to be part of the budget. Oh my God, it has to be part of the budget, right? But if the seniors all go to the town meeting, this is, a, this is chump change. How, how much does this program cost? $10,000, $15,000 a year? Yeah, that, like, if that. Nothing, right? To have your own place in your own senior center where your own seniors can come and your own caregivers can get a break, right? But that's going to take some people getting together and doing it. Now stay standing, okay. because the other thing that, that everybody needs to have, have access to it, it also are full day programs. And that's actually how Tammy started doing this stuff in the first place, because she runs one of these in Marlboro. That's how I actually got to, to meet her originally. Now tell her what a full day program kind of looks so, like. So Pleasantries offers Monday through Friday, hours 7 to 6. Um, it's social. So we don't provide medical care. But the important thing about Alzheimer's and dementia is socialization because socialization is actually slowing the progression of the disease process. And what, what you're doing is incredibly important. However, we do have agencies and such that can provide you know, companionship. The problem is it shouldn't absorb their whole day because the important thing is that they are engaged with their peers. That's the difference. I can go and spend a day with a person with dementia all day long and try to make their day better. But the idea is to have them in a program and then they're still at home. We're getting them out, getting them used to other people and confident about themselves because you're facilitating successful and purposeful and engaging activity. And when I said my model is the social model because there is another entity. You have the senior center, people can go there, choose their activities, participate in programs, but if you have dementia, that is a recipe for failure. So social is the next step, where they can engage. They still hold on to their independence. We may have to cue them, remind them, supervise them. The next step is medical model. And, and, but I don't want to go there because I'm going to okay. run out of time. What's the closest social model to right here? Mine. Yours. <laughs> and where else are they? There's one in Wayland? There's Wayland and Westwood. In Westwood. And right? I am hoping to expand to other communities because it's I, very needed. But I, but I guess I'm just suggesting to you, in this area, you need one of those, right? You need a place that's convenient that people can drive to easily, where folks can be there for the day, right? And, and, and have actually valuable programs. Two more things. You need to, and, and, and Framingham already has this. You have at least two assisted livings here in Framingham that have, are, are, that have um, dementia units so that you've got people who are dealing with these issues all the time. Those are the natural, first of all, you need it, you need those places because for folks who can't be living at home, you need a place to go, right? Um, secondly, you need those places because that's also where a lot of your training can come from. Many of these places, like, like Tammy's place, also ha have support groups for caregivers so that in, as an ongoing matter, they can be talking to each other about situations they're facing and getting training. Finally, you need a new model for nursing homes. Because in the longer run, in the longer run, there has to be an option for a person who truly cannot be anyplace else because they need so much care. They're not safe at home. There's no other alternative. But when we say nursing homes, we all go, ah, no, that's the last thing. I never want a nursing home. That's because of the way we're thinking about nursing homes. You, we need to think about nursing homes that are small that are community controlled, not controlled by somebody who's just trying to figure out how to make the most money, and that are community supported. And I'm gonna give you the model if you wanna find it, and it's in Nantucket. Now I know you're thinking, oh, Nantucket, they get so much money. 
I do a lot of work on Nantucket and Wells in Martha's Vineyard. The money flies in, the money flies out. The people who live there, they're the people that work at the restaurant, work on the ferry, do the postman, they're the teachers at the school. There's 14,000 people in Nantucket. They have a nursing home with 40 beds that's maybe 40 years old. And the first time I saw it, I went, ugh, it's so old and kind of creaky. It's wonderful. There are pictures on the wall, driven, you know, drawn by some of the local kids. They got music, they got performances. They've got a friend that's called Our Island Home. They have an entity called the Friends of Our Island Home that raises money for all of this stuff because it's community controlled. That's the future. That's that the future. And it gives you, and it, that's right, you, you walk into this place, it is unlike any nursing home you've ever been into, right? Because it's filled with local people, you know, and this kind of chit-chatting, you know, Ellie, how are you, blah, 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 you know? That's where this needs to go. Uh, that's all the time we got. But I, I'll take a quick question in case there's any questions, but otherwise you have to come back at 10.30 because we're doing the same presentation. <laughs> no, you're all good, thank you very much for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.